Welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner. And I am Tony Schmidt. And last week, Tony, you and I went to a rally here in Madison for... Mr. Bernie Sanders. Yes. Even wearing the t-shirt today. Yeah. Tony is wearing the Bernie for President t-shirt, which you got from Bernie's website. Yep. And he, Oh, what is the back? I think the back says something, too. Join the political revolution today. It took me a long time to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm, I've noticed that slogan used by his campaign a bit. And I'm, I don't know. I guess in terms of how politics works in the U.S., it is somewhat revolutionary to be like, no, we're not going to have big corporate donors. It's going to be small donations, and we're actually going to tackle issues that people care about. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a pretty radical break with politics as normal. Yeah. There's all sorts of different... Like, a revolution is just a change. Yeah. Now, the degree to which something must change to be considered a revolutionary change is different in different cases. And for socialists, I think we generally put a pretty high bar to calling something a revolution. <laughs> yeah. However, I will say that out of all of the major party political candidates, you could say that Bernie's campaign is revolutionary in the sense that it's doing certain things that none of the major party candidates are doing. And with great success. Yes. Better success than, uh, I guess, all of the political pundits and everything expected, as evidenced by the aforementioned rally in Madison, which was the largest of any political candidate uh, so far in this presidential election, I believe the official numbers were right around 10,000. Yeah, yeah. Which, it, yeah. Yeah, filled the venue. Yeah, I it mean, was packed. Part of the, uh, maybe it could have been bigger, I don't know, but it, it couldn't have been much bigger because there was barely a seat in the Coliseum, which is where the event was held, or yeah. sometimes called the Alliant Energy Center. That's the... That's the, like, corporate name for it. Yeah. Or I think a, I saw some of the newspapers reported it with a different name. It was all, it's also the Veterans Memorial something. Yeah. We have three names for this building. Yeah. Although, tech, the Line Energy Center might actually be the building next to, I have no idea. Oh, okay. Like, the whole complex might be that, and specifically the one, and nobody cares about this, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but 10,000 people at a political event is a big deal, and like you mentioned, that no other political candidate has had an event that big, except there, I understand that one of the Republican candidates had a uh, their, their announcement speech for running. I forget which one it was even now. Maybe Marco Rubio, or I don't know. One of them had an event that was 14,000 people when well, he announced his candidacy. If it was Donald Trump, he literally paid people to show up. Well, th the, this, these people were not paid to show up at okay. the event that I read about. They, then it probably was However, Trump. it was at a university, and attendance was required by the student body. And it was like a 14,000-person student body, and like 12,000 people showed up. Was this a private university? It might have been. Because I don't know how a public university could compel people to show up. Like, if I, I got an email from yeah. my, Attendance is my chancellor that said, you need to show up to this political rally for somebody, I would reply with a, um, not kind words. Yeah, I mean, and probably a, 
angry letter to the Board of Regents and anybody else who I could think of to complain about who would ignore me. Yeah. Because that's crossing a big line. Well, and maybe it was just a soft required. Who knows? Well, clearly not everyone not everyone showed up because the school is 14,000 people and they only had, they have less than that at the event, like 12 or 13 or 11,000, something like that. So there was a slightly bigger event. However... There were a lot of there. There was some part of the audience, a major part of the audience, that was required to be there. Whether, although the, it probably was not a very hard requirement, yeah, I would I'd, presume. I'd be curious to see uh, the reactions from the crowd for stuff because, like, for Bernie, uh, he he had some trouble keeping people quiet, especially when he oh, said, man. "What was it?" He said, "Like, if we win, or like we can win," like as the first part of a sentence, and. And he couldn't quiet the crowd after that to finish <laughs> because people and stuff cheering. But if you watch like uh, Donald Trump's announcement thing where he paid people and saying all of his incredibly ridiculous racist stuff, like it sounded like just because you could only see him, it sounded like there were five people in the audience because like a few people would clap for that stuff and a few people would yell stuff. Clearly, all very sarcastically. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the um, it I will say this that the it was really cool to see Bernie. I've seen him before, actually. He was at the Fighting Bob Progressive Fest here in uh, Wisconsin, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, which is a very small town in Wisconsin here. Um, when he was thinking about his Candace candidacy i and, and i think of he it was a bunch of events like that that he went through to throughout the the u.s to kind of gauge the audience and feel out if if he thought there was enough you know will to to put together a political campaign so it was cool to be there for that and then to see him again now with after the announcing because at fighting bob fest there was probably I don't know, maybe a thousand people total. The, it, it wasn't anywhere near as big as this last one. So now that he's announced his candidacy, it's it's amazing to see all the people that have gotten behind him to to voice their support for Sanders. Yeah, I I was in, I was scanning the crowd to see if I could figure out any sort of demographic stuff. And I did notice a good bit of young people. Uh, people around our age or younger, so 20s, 30s. Actually, there were some kids who looked like they were in high school, too, mm-hmm. um, which isn't necessarily terribly helpful because they might not actually be able to vote. <laughs> yeah, but they school. will be soon. Maybe yeah. not in this election, but... And there were a lot of older people. I don't know. I couldn't exactly tell how many like middle-aged people there were. Well, that's how it is for every political thing because that's who... I think is most motivated and often has the most amount of time. Like wow. as w- if you work a full time job and have children, that makes things difficult. As we know from not doing both of them, but <laughs> you work a part time job and sometimes go to school and have children. I work a full time salary job, which <laughs> can rack up the hours pretty quickly. Yeah. I also noticed um, lots of white people and almost exclusively white people, which is a big issue because, Mm -hmm. I mean, his message is class-based, not not racially based like, oh, Donald Trump. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry. It's it's just so hard not to pick on him. He is a cartoon. Yeah. The kind of cartoon that is for adults that you don't let children watch. It's the kind of cartoon that they made in, like, the, the 30s and 40s and 50s. Yeah, that, like, where Bugs Bunny says something really racist and they won't show it on TV anymore, but, like, yeah. you can find them still. Yeah, the Dumbo Crows. Yeah. 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 The, those kind of cartoons. <laughs> He's one of those kind of <laughs> cartoons. Um, But, yeah, it, so it's something that that needs to be worked on for the Bernie campaign is reaching a cross racial divide that apparently exists within people hearing his stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, it's obviously it's a broad based appealing message. So I don't know. I don't know why that is. If it's just that 
not enough people have heard about him yet, or if, like, because I'd be surprised if they're not trying to act Lee Orca, that maybe it's just too early. I mean, I think that there are going to be some challenges when it comes to just, like, his presentation and how he comes off, like, his personality with reaching out to minorities, because, I mean, he's just really white. <laughs> like, that that's maybe not the right, right way to say it, but... The longtime senator from Vermont is very white. Yeah, and what? I mean, he's like, yeah, he's got, like, that... Like, kind of Boston-ish almost accent. I'm not exactly sure. But some, like, clearly yeah. he's a New Englander and he's, like, this old white guy that I I think he just, culturally and personality-wise, I think he might have a hard time connecting with minority groups. I don't know. That's that's just a guess, but... Yeah. I like that you said New Englander because we should also mention with the Sanders campaign the old Englander and the other Sanders campaign, and there's his brothers running for MP and somewhere in England. Oh, really? Yep. Huh. His brother lives in England, I guess, for a really long time. Hmm. And, yeah, he's running, I think, on the Green Party ticket as an MP. So if you uh, live in the district that I don't even know, maybe I have no idea how their policies line up either. <laughs> but if his brother is a Green Party candidate in the UK, it's eh, probably, it's probably not terribly far, yeah. Yeah. The thing about attending a political rally that I thought we already mentioned that that there were had to, there had to be a lot of pauses because people were clapping a lot and and shouting a lot in 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 support of Bernie. It got a little annoying. That in my in I mean maybe I'm just an old curmudgeon, but it's like the amount of actual Bernie speaking had to be like far less than half the total amount of time because people cheered and clapped at almost every phrase. Like, he couldn't get out a whole sentence sometimes yeah. because, as you pointed out, people were cheering a lot. And there was that very zealous guy in front of us as well. That probably didn't help. <laughs> if that's yeah, your opinion. yeah, very it amped was, up gentleman. Yeah, it was, it was very... It was good that he's passionate. <laughs> yeah. I think he wanted to always be the first person to respond to possibly a phrase. <laughs> or at least he wanted Bernie to know he was there. Yeah. Which is very possible. <laughs> Could be. What did you think of that? I mean, I I liked that I got to hear his points on topics spelled out pretty well. I thought they were good points. None of it I disagreed with. Uh a lot of it I wished would go a little further, or a lot further, depending. Like, um, the big one that surprised me a little bit on uh, where I thought he would go further was when it came to student debt. I mean, he mm -hmm. wants to make college free, which is great, but the issue I've come up with when talking uh, to my coworkers, who are also college students and much younger college students, or all, I think, juniors, seniors, is... Their response to that is, well, that's great. I won't be in college that much longer. What does free college have to do for me? Which I'm always irritated when people make the, but what do I get out of it argument. Mm -hmm. uh, and his response for the what to do about existing college debt, I was hoping he would do something like the DSA has been pushing, which is the wiping the student debt clean. But it was just a refinancing at a lower level, which, again, isn't a bad thing. It would be very helpful to a lot of people. But I think that more needs to be done with that. Or, you know, maybe some sort of debt forgiveness if you've paid whatnot. Or just have the government take that debt up and then write it off. Or I think that the, if you want to reform higher education funding and and the huge student loan problem that we have is that you have to do both in order to get everyone on board. Because if you're only going to do it for the current or future students, or you're only going to do it for the um, people that have already gone through, which would be like the, you know, maybe debt restructuring, debt forgiveness, whatever, that I think you're going to have to have both camps to make that a winning thing. You know, just in the world of politics, like you got to get enough people on board to get things done. I think it has to be both. You're yeah. right. 
Uh, his is also the best I've heard of the candidates for that, even with as that not going as far as I think it should. Because I, I saw something about uh, Mark O'Malley, the third other than Hillary Clinton uh, Democrat who's officially running. Mm-hmm. His like whole thing was basically simply that. Like that was it wasn't even make college free. It was just like let's have lower interest rates. Mm-hmm. I believe so. His was even more tepid. But the article was very excited about it, and I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> like again, it's not it's not bad to have that. It just doesn't go far enough cuz what we clearly need and I don't understand ever why this is like a point of contention is higher education is hugely beneficial to the entire economy. It's beneficial to the states, the cities, the big businesses, the country as a whole. Mm-hmm. Just scientific progress, arts, humanities, it's just super important. It does wonders economically, culturally. Mm-hmm. So the it not being free is the most bizarre thing in the world because there's a clear benefit to everyone. Yeah, especially, I mean, technology is kind of one of our pet issues on the podcast. We like to come back to it a lot. But when you look at all of the things that computers and robots are going to be able to do, you know, I I looked at, I don't know if we mentioned this on the podcast yet. I saw one of those stupid Facebook posts, you know, people share things on Facebook. It was a map of the U.S. that showed the most common profession for each state. So oh. just in each state, it told you what the most common profession was. And it would actually went through uh, a few decades where you'd see how it changed over the years. Interesting. Currently, you know what the most common is it, but in most states, I want to say at least half, maybe more of the states. Uh, sales or IT? No. Truck driver. Oh. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people just driving semis out there. I suppose, and, yeah. Or driving truck for some other purpose or whatever. There's a lot of people doing that, and you know. The, there's, you know, Google has self-driving cars. They aren't, you know, in wide use right now, but that's going to be a huge thing when that comes out. And, I mean, basically the easiest stuff to automate is the stuff that largely does not require a degree. So there already is, in Nevada, one automated semi in use, mm. like being used by a company. There's one already. Okay. So one, one, the first trucker's job has been lost to yeah. uh, an automated driving system. Yeah. So, so actually, I don't know if somebody has to sit in them. Somebody might actually still have to sit in them at this point. Okay. I am not 100% on how that, if this one works like that. But it I might th- not. But, but I think the point is that if we want, to be prepared for the economy of the future probably you know the the higher education the jobs where you need a higher education are going to be ones that will be automated and replaced by machines last (laughs) yeah here's my other thought on the rally i felt like if you follow a candidate, you kind of already know what they're going to say. Like, everything that Bernie said, maybe I didn't know, like, all the details of every little thing he was going to say. And he did make uh, a pretty good dig at Walker, yeah. which is our Republican governor here in Wisconsin. If anybody has managed to miss the news, which crosses the globe these days with the ridiculousness he does. Yeah, but I'll, I'll be honest. No, I, don't, I, I don't follow the BS that every... Republican governor does in all of the 50 United States. No, but So I like, would expect most of our listeners probably don't pay very much attention. I saw an article on The to, Guardian Walker. the other day about Walker. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like... He, I guess he is he's a presidential per- candidate He's now. particularly well publicized, especially after the uprising stuff, because that got international following. So the shenanigans he's up to do actually tend to carry pretty far and wide. Wow. Yeah. This is about the 20-week abortion ban they want to put in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
that look, there's so many terrible things. It's hard to keep track of them. The the rally, though, I felt like I already knew ninety percent of what he was going to say because I've seen him say it before, or I've read it, or whatever. It's you know the standard stuff, and you know when you're running for president, you're not going to come up with like new material for every single campaign stop that you make, so it's not a surprise. Yeah. So I kind you know for a moment I was like, what's the point of this? And I think I think there are some points. I think part of it is to just you know see what the turnout will be you know basically if you can get a bunch of people to come and sit in a, in a stadium and listen to you speak that's a pretty good sign that people will come out go into a voting booth and you know pull the lever for you yeah those are ten thousand votes you can count on although ours is not a lever here we we it's like a an arrow that has the middle part missing, and you got to fill in the middle part of the arrow. Yep. It's drawing a line. Yeah. Drawing a straight line. you got to fill in the... Yeah. Yeah. I go back and forth a bunch of times just because I want to make sure it gets Oh, do you in. not get the markers normally? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you do it a lot with the markers? Yeah, you know, like maybe three or four times back and forth. Oh, Because oh, really? I want to fill in... The, it's a thick line. It's like a... Yeah. You just do one? Yeah, I want to make it as wide the on the left as it is on the if right. If there's an issue or not when you put it in, that's true. I've never. Had, I do like I've a just, one. I. <laughs> it's. I think we found that I'm like a neurotic person. <laughs> well, <laughs> the listeners have. <laughs> yes. Okay. But yeah, I think part of it is to find out, you know, what kind of momentum does does your campaign have? Like, what do people? who, you know, regular, ordinary, everyday people, what do they think? You know, what will they come out and see you? Yeah. And that's a good indication of what kind of momentum, what kind of interest, you know, where your, where your campaign is going. Yeah. I think also I was looking at his schedule around this. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is ours was the only big rally schedule the rest were town hall meetings like he was going to iowa and then minnesota and you know sort of the midwest a bit to just do um town hall meetings which is very different from what a lot of other because a lot of yeah. candidates only do these sort of big speech and speech things but you know he's actually going out and i mean that's how he's won in vermont with you know, I think he won seventy percent last time he ran for senator. Yeah. But he goes, he listens to people, he talks to people, he actually responds to the questions. Yeah. That's a very integral and important part of his campaign. And you know, I mean, that's. You mean he's acting like a democracy is actually supposed to function, where yes. the representatives listen to the people and yeah. try to do what they want? Yeah, and I cannot imagine any Republican candidate or really any of the other Democratic candidates doing this more than once or twice their entire campaign, whereas he's doing it, you know, two, three, four times a week. Mm -hmm. And I believe he's also going back to D.C. to make sure he's, like, voting on stuff, too, which is, you know, sitting uh, politicians don't always bother to show up for things like when Clinton ran last time, Mm -hmm. And she was, uh, I believe she was a senator at that time. She I, I abstained from most stuff. So did, if you look at uh, John McCain and Barack Obama, mm -hmm. when actually something was going on in Washington, they'd made it a big deal where they were both going to stop campaigning and go do their job that they were supposed to be doing. <laughs> like, I, I want to try that someday at a job and be like, look, guys, i got to stop doing this job. I'm going to go upstairs, talk to the bigwigs, shake some hands, campaign for that promotion. So I can't be bothered to do this job for now. But let me know if something really serious comes up and I might show up to do the work. Yeah. I'm sure that'll go over really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Uh. We got to talk about Greece then. Yeah. So I guess we should put a disclaimer in that we're recording this on July 12th. So, yeah. July 12th, it is almost exactly 2:30 p.m. at the moment in Madison, Central Time. Yeah, Central Time. So, by the time this comes out, 
Probably at everything the end. will have changed. Yeah. Probably three or four times. Who knows? We can start with the stuff that's already happened. So the, yeah, I think that's a good place to start because some people have been following this very closely. But I think it'd be good to make sure that we're all on the same page. Right. So, and, and the way that we summarize it might be different than other people. So it's a different perspective. Right. So about, uh, I don't know what you'd say, two 300 BC, there was a empire <laughs> called... <laughs> <laughs> Too <Right>. far back? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, Greece is the place that invented democracy. Yeah, and, although, you know... And there was a guy named Socrates who put a, a hemlock in his ear and died. What's a hemlock? Hemlock's a poison. Yeah. Yeah. From a plant, I think? Yeah. No, it's... Did he juice it? Did they have I don't juicers? Think he, I don't think he... I thought he just swallowed it. Oh. Did he? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, th- I thought it was in his ear, but it doesn't matter. Maybe. I mean, you could pour poison in your ear, I guess. Although I will say, with you, you know, when America likes to talk about democracy. Uh, it was probably getting too far off topic. Whatever, I'm going to say it anyway, quick, because we're talking about Greece. Um, you know, likes to talk about democracy and stuff, but really, we don't model after Greek democracy. We model after Roman republicanism, which is where you have a higher elected body. Which I don't even know how well elected they were. You like a class of politicians um, mm-hmm. in Rome, whereas Greece, you the people who were in charge were randomly selected, and all people who could vote, which was all males, were free to go and vote because they had the time for it. Because, mm-hmm. as I don't remember if it was Aristotle or Socrates, I think it was only males of a certain class as well, right? Yeah, not, landowning, not all males, yeah, but... landowning males. Yep. Um, but that's according to. It was, I want to say Aristotle, why slaves and women existed to do all the other stuff so men could be free so, to so have the time the yeah, <laughs> and vote and everything. Uh, anyway, things have changed in Greece since then. Yeah. Uh, and so you probably noticed in about 2008, 2009, uh, there was a bit of a financial dip. <laughs> for the world. <laughs> just a little bump in the road. Yeah, a little bump. Well, that's how they present it now. Almost just sickening. Um, and a lot of this stuff was uh, housing stuff, you know, big construction booms and stuff. And one of the places where there was a lot of construction stuff going on was Greece. Skip lots of details. Greece ended up with a lot of this debt and suddenly an economy that was doing very, very poorly and not really much money. Mm-hmm. And they've needed, I believe they've had two bailouts so far uh, because Greece is part of the Eurozone and the Euro currency. And the dumbest thing about the Euro currency is that they don't have shared debt like we do in the United States. The United States, we have a shared debt. That's why. In other a- words, all we have a federal government where all the 50 states are part of that government and it's just everybody's debt, the whole nation's debt. There's no, you can't point to one part of the federal debt and say, this part belongs to Wisconsin and this is California and so forth. Right. But you can do that with euros in the eurozone. Right. It's, I mean, if Cal, if we did this, California would be in worse shape than Greece. Like, their, their debt is almost ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I guess we do have individual state budgets, so we've right. got both. But our federal government is it's the reason... far more important here than any right. um, Eurozone-level government they have there. They're largely still federated nations where we're one nation... Right. In different areas. And that's the reason why, yeah, California can have debt and California isn't subject to all this problems that Greece is subject to. And a small side note, uh, Puerto Rico is not part, it's part of the United States territory, but not part of the United States. And Puerto Rico is going through something very similar to Greece, into which the United States is doing nothing about. So. Like, if you want a good juxtaposition for how that works in and out just in the United States, you have Puerto Rico and you have California. But Puerto Rico is, that have to be its own, because that's also... You know, I think I think another comparison would also be Detroit. Yeah, oh yeah, Detroit. Well, that's a, yeah. That's a comparison that gets made a lot about financial disciplining. 
Yeah. Um, because Detroit, yeah, the city of Detroit did it went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And I think I think one of the important things to point out here, because everyone calls it the Greek debt crisis, and the debt is kind of how it's always framed. I I don't know if this is if this comparison is still true. I I saw it come out at one point that the debt of the U.S. federal government per person mm. is about the same as the Greek debt per person. Oh, yeah. So the big difference, it's not that their debt is that big. It's that their economy is in shambles because they were hit way harder by the crisis than anyone else. Right. Because they don't have monetary sovereignty. Cause well, that's a part of it. I mean, I don't think that that... None of the Eurozone countries have monetary sovereignty. Right. So it wasn't that's that why they the get, only thing. That's why they get hard hit harder, though, because the United States... The reason the United States has a good credit rating is because at any time we can print up the amount of – we can just print money. And they can't, meaning that they can actually default. So that factors into their risk, which factors into their loans and bailouts and stuff, which mm -hmm. hurts their economy more. Because if people think it's more risky that they might not actually make their money back, they put less in. That's why I, I think it's a pretty sizable factor it's the main one as to why greece is having these issues well i think the the, the state of the economy f comes oh, yeah. into it too because yeah. like the the u.s can continue to borrow money nobody's you know uh forcing us to go through austerity or structural adjustment programs that's what the imf usually calls it when it's like a third world nation that they do this to yeah um but, you know, basically, the, the Greece needs money to keep functioning. Yeah. So even though they have a lot of debt, they need money to keep things going because otherwise, you know, the buses stop running sort of thing. And in order to and, – and the U.S. does this too. All, all sorts of nations all over the world continue to borrow money in order to, you know, keep things moving smoothly. Right. With and I Greece – the creditors are a little bit afraid because they see how awful the economy is there and they are getting a little bit nervous that they're not going to get their money back. Yeah. I will also say, as far as national debt goes, with the exclusion of places that don't have, like the United States national debt, the Republicans like to use this as, uh, well, we need to cut these things. The United States national debt actually really kind of doesn't matter. We owe most of the debt to ourselves in the most confusing way. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, people complain about China, oh, like, oh, China is going to own us. But it's not like China has no debt one. We probably own actually a bit of China's debt. But it's just something that all countries do is they like, mm -hmm. they just rack up this debt. It's really not a big deal unless you suddenly are unable to pay, which if you don't have, uh, Currency sovereignty is a problem, or in like in the United States, if you have something ridiculous where you get to allow a very partisan Congress to decide whether or not it should keep paying things, which is the last time the United States was downgraded, is because Congress, for absolutely no reason, decided that yeah, maybe we won't pay, even though that's not an option. Hmm. So, yeah, national debt really isn't a big deal as long as it's within an average worldwide range like if yeah. your you know national debt is 20 times everybody else that's a problem but if your national debt's about what everybody else's is, is it really doesn't make a big difference it's mm -hmm. it's not a problem yep uh, so the creditors that hold greece's debt which is a lot of different european banks some public banks some private banks but different banks throughout europe who were all also bailed out we should mention yes yeah banks that got their bailout but now are a little bit worried about greece and aren't really sure they want to bail out greece unless they think that they can get their money back yeah and basically they think that the best way to get their money back is to really make greece hurt yeah. to to lower you know to get you know lower pension payments to the elderly to basically do all of these extreme right wing things to cut all of the social 
to cut back on social safety net things and to make a more free market system. Right. Which unfettered capitalism. Right. Which in case uh anybody is wondering, uh the economics of that make the economy worse instead of better. Which is another reason why Greece is having problems yeah. now is because they've accepted two bailouts on these terms mm-hmm. of harsh austerity and Surprise, surprise, it's only making the situation far, far worse because yeah. they have – the government has less power, it has less money, it has less stuff to do stuff with, and still has just as much, if not more, debt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the this is interesting because the argument as to whether or not these measures will improve or hurt the economy is an eternally ongoing debate between uh, economists on the left and economists on the right. Right. Uh, Even though it shouldn't be. Yeah, the right-wingers always say this is the way to prosperity, and the left-wingers always say that's just going to make things worse. Right. Well, I mean, part of it, it's ignoring the fact that governments are responsible for a huge amount of economic demand. The government is a huge driving factor in so many industries. Mm Mm-hmm. That once you start to cut back on what the government does, you start to really see sluggish growth and stuff. Also, part of the reason why the United States has been so slow to recover for your average working person is Mm -hmm. because the U.S. government has been pulling back more and more and more. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about Greece is... They did try it. They, I think they started implementing these reforms oh, yeah. in 2011. So they've had at least four years to see how well this works. And it's making things much, much worse. So for, for all the different debates that can go on about this, we know for certain that it did not work for Greece. Yeah. Things have simply just gotten worse there. Yeah. They are in a depression. I've actually seen chart comparisons between their current depression and the Great Depression, and theirs is lower and longer than the Great Depression was for the United States. Yeah. Their their youth unemployment rate is sky high. It's something like 40%, maybe more than that. And, and their overall employment is, I think, close to 30%. It's just awful. You know, they've just suffered greatly from this depression. And the response of a lot of the rest of Europe has been to say they must suffer further. They need to cut even more of of their social safety net. Yeah, and they were offered a proposal which the Syriza government, which is a left-wing coalition government... Yeah, we, we should met, talk oh, yeah. about that too. Cause, so the, the Greeks, during the crisis and and for some time after it, had been ruled by, like, their standard conservative party and their standard... It's a... PASOK was the name. It was their socialist party. But it was a socialist party that is closer to, like, the Democrats in the U.S. The Liberal Party. Yeah. You wouldn't call it a revolutionary socialist or a left-wing socialist. They were, you know, social Democrats or something like that. Yeah. But um, all of a sudden, a bunch of left-wing groups uh, formed a coalition, and that coalition was called Syriza. Yeah, minus notably the Communist Party of Greece. That's right. Which did a really weird thing to completely isolate itself and sort of push itself away from everybody. It actually did a lot worse in the last elections because they, I don't know, they took a really weird stance. Yeah, and I guess I I would love to l- learn more about this. I my understanding is that Greece has a decently strong communist party because of the their civil war and you know kind of what what the communists had won during that time. You know they didn't they didn't end up on top after the civil war, but I guess they were close to it. And so the, the Greece has a tradition with that. Yeah, and who knows the communist party may. Be able to win. I mean, I, I say it's an odd. Po- it seems like an odd thing, but you know, honestly, it could, depending on how this shakes out, work in the Communist Party's favor, and they could end up taking over. Yeah, I because they've I'm been ones of that, but it is possible. I'm, yeah, but I mean, I don't know when the next election cycle is. I think it's a while, but at the moment, I know they're holding uh, the 
massive demonstrations the Communist Party is mm. about this stuff. Uh, so Syriza um, ended up being the largest uh, vote getter in the last election. They got 30% of the vote, yeah. uh, which think... which may be confusing to American listeners. How can you win with 30%? Well, there's a lot of parties that get voted for, and 30 was the largest amount that anyone got. Right. So they had to form a coalition. Um, yeah. But, but they did. Yeah. It, they were only... Uh, six or seven seats shy of having an actual absolute majority in mm-hmm. Parliament. Um, so, I mean, again, 30 isn't a lot, but for the way their election stuff works, it's a good a good bit. Mm-hmm. And they ran on an anti-austerity program. The, their program was the reforms that we've done were the opposite of what we should have done. We, we reformed in the wrong direction. Austerity was wrong. It made things worse. No more austerity. We're going to fight against this. Yeah. And, and that's what they've tried to do. However, sort of. <laughs> their creditors are so strongly opposed to any thinking that does not involve austerity. You know, especially Germany. They're kind of leading the, the charge on this. Germany. Specifically Merkel, the mm-hmm. chancellor. Yes. Yep. Yeah, she's kind of the the figurehead that has to do that and represents all of the German interests that are most concerned about enforcing that austerity. Syriza came out pretty strong, and I think the person I've paid a lot of attention to with Syriza is uh, Yanis Varoufakis, mm-hmm. who was until very recently their finance minister, because I he's a Marxist, and I think he's got his head screwed on absolutely right in terms of all of this stuff and if you want a good explanation as to how he sees stuff we'll put a link to uh tom o'brien who was a guest a while ago Mm -hmm. interviewed him in 2013 or 2014 um about the issues in greece uh before this so i think we'll have to put a link to that because that if you guys have not listened to that is a very good episode uh, to get what's going on there that's on tom's alpha to omega podcast yes um but i i think yeah their their insistence on austerity is yeah summed up by their the other european countries dislike or especially the people in charge of mr or i should say dr varifakis because his approach was basically telling them how they were all wrong and dumb which is true and that they need to do it a different way, without austerity and with some debt forgiveness. And they weren't keen on that message. Yeah. Well, the, I think there are, it's very interesting how the actual personalities have played out. Because he, the viral focus, as I understand it, is has a background both in academic economics mm-hmm. and also in the tech industry. He's worked in the tech industry, and that he has not been a lefty all his life. He's one. Of, he's someone who um, came to left wing politics later in life, and that all combines together to this very interesting position where he's very confident, very informal. You know, like if you watch him, he doesn't wear a suit and a tie. I think that comes from the tech industry stuff that's that's common in the tech industry to you know not bother like about wearing a suit and a tie and very confident and i think that comes from his uh, acad like his success in academia and also his success in the tech industry i mean he's a very successful person in his life and you know he understands what he's talking about and is confident in himself and that is definitely not what the uh the the creditors and other folks wanted to to hear they wanted you know someone who would come sobbing begging yeah yeah kiss um, their feet call them wonderful which is interestingly a lot of these other smaller periphery countries as they are sometimes called uh have been doing uh, like Ireland, who was severely disciplined in a very similar fashion, mm-hmm. has oddly been championing the cause of the creditors 
and a lot of these other countries, presumably so that they stay in their good favor in case they need money, so that they're all not treated to the same nonsense that Greece is. Well, and I think that there's also a strong psychological thing going on, that when a country does accept harsh austerity, that, I mean, clearly there's going to be people on the left side of the spectrum that will always have thought that that was the wrong way to go and say that that was a massive mistake and why did we ever do that? Mm -hmm. But I think any time that anyone makes any decision, there's this psychological phenomenon where you want to justify it after you have done it. You know, it's it's sometimes hard to min admit a mistake. Yeah. And so, the psychologically, you always try to justify your action in reverse. And I think that's somewhat what's going on. You know, I don't know for sure. I, 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 I haven't, you know, like studied the psychology of, of Ireland or the other uh, nations. But I think it's when when you've made a decision as a country to go one way, it's hard to feel... Uh, to see another group saying that's the absolute wrong way to go. And and I think it's going to be hard to make allies with that group then at that point. Yeah. And two, it might even just be the, it's probably mostly just the ruling class as well, the people who are in power. That, yeah. Is opposed, because I know there's plenty of people who are against this throughout the entire Eurozone, mm -hmm. um, who, and I guess we should bring up the, the vote, who, so the creditors, Gay came up with a small, small loan again that they were willing to give for again huge cuts, and Greece finally fed up, decided to put it to a popular vote in Greece as to whether or not they should accept the terms, which is I think that pretty was pretty ballsy. I think that was a very smart move. Oh yeah. So so I think it's brilliant. So Greece turns to its people and says. This is what the rest of Europe is offering us. Should we accept that offer? Yes or no? And the government said, you know, the, the Syriza-led government said, we think it should be no, but if you, the Greek people, think it should be yes, just tell us. And, and then they, they agreed that they would resign, probably because they firmly believe it was such a wrong thing that they wouldn't be willing to do it, but they'd let their successors do it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, so, I'm facially foreshadowing. <laughs> so, what happened is the the Greek people came out, and, and well, I should say this, the polls, because there are a bunch of polls taken beforehand, the polls predicted that it was too close to call. Yeah. Every poll that was done got, was you know, right down the middle with within the margin of error. Nobody could tell if the Greek people would vote yes or no. Well, the day of the election came. Mm. Hold on, we need to mention one other thing that they did. As soon as the government did that, the European Central Bank decided to stop doing what it's supposed to do and immediately ceased all funding to the Greek banks as well oh, yeah. to squeeze the country and try and force a yes vote. So Yeah, so for a week, people could not access their funds more than 60 euros every day. Still today. They still, banks are still not open. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so that's a scary thing. Right, and it's, no, there's no reason for that other than that the European Central Bank is trying to force everybody into such a miserable state that they accept the terms. Yeah, so... So, yeah, the, the European Central Bank is basically scaring the Greek people. It's saying, you can't get your money. Yeah. Well, and the European Central Bank has played a pretty checkered history, and even the Greek Central Bank, because during parts of these negotiations, you know, they have these uh, billions of dollars that are due every so often to be paid back, and Greece needed money, so they were accepting, they were negotiating for really unfavorable ter terms, it turns out that the Greek central bank had a bunch of money that they didn't bother to tell the government about because central banks, according to capitalist stuff, are supposed to maintain a large degree of autonomy. Mm -hmm. So in order to 
allegedly, although I say absolutely, to force the Greeks to take worse terms, their own central bank was acting against the people and against the government and hiding money hmm. for them. And, you know, since they're also part of the European Central Bank, that doesn't surprise me. And even the European Central Bank, because after that came out, uh, a lot of the Syriza ministers and uh, MPs were calling for the resignation of the head of the Greek Central Bank, to which the European Central Bank threatened them with action because they considered that uh, violating the anonymity or autonomy of the Greek Central Bank, which apparently is autonomy to be above and beyond all of the people and what's good for the country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also, by the way, the way most central banks operate. So, good luck there. Like, the U.S. Central yeah. Bank is technically a not part of the government. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. The well, and I I think there's an argument to be made for the you know you know you don't want the president controlling what the central bank does. I think under capitalism and the way politics are now, there's an argument for it. Yep. But not ideally, and certainly not in a situation like this. Yep. Or at least to have that level of autonomy. Anyway. Sorry. Well, yeah. I mean, the hard part is, is what do you do when they're doing something really w wrong? Then how do you hold them accountable? Right. That's that's the problem that the autonomy then creates. So yep. autonomy solves one problem, but it creates this other problem. Yeah. Contradictions. We should. I should say contradictions to make the podcast sound a little bit more traditionally Marxist. Yeah. Anyway. The vote ended up with 61% of the people voting no. In other words, rejecting austerity, which is exactly what Syriza wanted. They voted with Syriza on a no vote with a 39 voting yes. And that was, it blew everyone away. Nobody yeah. thought it would, that you'd have that many no's. So that was a really strong position for Syriza to be in. Yeah. To say, we have more people, that, you know, they only got 30% of the vote when they got in. And when it came to this referendum, they got twice that. They got 61%, more than twice that. Yeah. So that's a very strong and clear mandate and really showing what the Greek people wanted. Which leads to the current confusion. Yeah. So <laughs> the very first thing that happened after the vote was that Alex Tsipras, the prime, prime minister... minister I forget if it's president or prime minister. Prime minister, Alex, asked Giannis Varoufakis, the finance minister who we mentioned earlier, to resign. And Giannis resigned. As a sacrifice to the creditors. Yeah. Although, the, let me ask you this. This is going to be maybe where the first parts of our opinion become very strong. Do you think that Alex did not want to uh did not want Giannis to resign? No, I think he wanted him to resign. I think that especially based upon then what happened next, I definitely think he wanted him to resign because I would say uh Varoufakis did I th he held uh, very strongly what I would call the correct position, and that is you cannot accept any more austerity. There needs to be a large debt write-off mm -hmm. and a loan with reasonable terms where they can change and run the country in a more socialist fashion in a way that's actually good for the Greek people, good for the Greek economy, and, you know, is in line with what the Greek people want. Uh, you know what? I think I should also point out here that Everything that I saw from Giannis before his resignation, so every time he talked about his position and Greece's position, and and I saw some interviews with him where he was directly challenged by, I think, a, a German citizen and and folks like that. They all said, you know what, you know what about we want, you know, we loaned you this money, we want you to pay back this money, we want you to make good on the loans. And Giannis never challenged that. Giannis always said, we want to pay you back. We do not want to have our debt written off. We want it restructured. And restructured means maybe a little bit longer for it. We don't want to have to impose this harsh austerity. Basically, he said, we want to be able to run our own economy. Don't tell us 
you know, where to cut or what to do. We're going to run our economy the way that we know how so that we can pay back the loans. He he always said that he wanted to make good on those loans and that he wanted to pay them back, which, I mean, it's not like he was saying, we're not going to pay this debt, you know, which, which maybe some people in Greece or some people would want him to say. But he, I mean, it was not nearly as extreme as I think some people will make you think. That he, his point was he wanted a strong Greek economy to pay so that he could pay back the loans. Yeah, it should. I think we also should mention with all of this the just absolute smear campaign and almost all of the press about the Greeks and the Greek economy. Yeah, complaining about retirement age and pensions and stuff like that and. It's like the pensions aren't a problem. Like the pensions don't cause the Greek government debt. Pension funds work by somebody works and a portion of their pay goes into this fund. And then when they retire, they get money from that. The reason it's a point of contention is because like Detroit, the creditors want to raid that pension fund because they know there's money there. Yeah. Yeah. And like Detroit, the because what would happen with Detroit is the there was the city didn't have enough money to pay both the creditors and the pensions. Yeah. And what did the court say? The court said, Well, turns out you can, you know, screw people out of their pensions in order to pay the banks. Yeah. I still don't understand how that's supposed to work, how money you've already been paid for work you've done can suddenly be taken away from you to pay rich people <laughs> well some pension funds aren't funded entirely so i think that was part of the problem is that governments promised future pension funds but didn't pay into them at the time right but uh, that still isn't the fault of the pensioners <laughs> yes uh i i agree with that wholly but um but basically it's it's a promise just like the promise to pay the bank so at, at the very least you're on equal footing um and and uh, you know, when it came down to decide, okay, we can't pay both. Who are we going to pay? Turns out you have to pay the the banks and not the people. Yeah. And th- I think the, a very similar thing is going on with Greece where they, that's, I mean, that's what the uh, austerity programs are. Cut the pensions so that you can pay the creditors. Right. And also, too, it should also be mentioned that the creditors are kind of also the people who cause the problem. Because, like we mentioned, the banks got a bailout because they were doing all this ridiculous stuff. And all of this rest of it then was left with people like Greece. And also, mm-hmm. too, like Germany always is like, oh, well, we're the largest creditor. That's because Germany has positioned itself in the Eurozone where they're mainly export based. Mm-hmm. That's how you make a lot of money in the world market, is you're export based. They export to the rest of the Eurozone. Which means that they're constantly running a surplus to everyone else's deficit. Yeah. Because everyone's buying from them and they're taking all that money. So yeah. for them to be like, oh, those lazy Greeks and all this stuff, oh, I can't believe that. It's part of the reason they don't have money is they've been buying stuff from the Germans <laughs> whose banks made this crisis, who destroyed their economy, who then they want that money back for, for the right. stuff that they gave them money. It's like burning somebody's house down. And then asking them to be paid to put it out is kind of what that's. This oh, is I like. mean, they weren't burning down the house, but it was like if, okay, if it's the like Greeks... they were playing with matches in the house, and it started <laughs> on fire, and they made sure they got rescued, and they were like, "Look, we can come and grab you, but it's going to be kind of costy." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th- I think like you were saying, if if the Greeks hadn't gone into some of the debt they have, then German businesses would be sitting there trying to still find a buyer for some of their products. So it's not like the the Germans didn't play their part in participating in this. That's just something to keep in mind, I think. Yeah. Where do we get to? Varoufakis resigned. Yes. At the asking of the Prime Minister. Mm Mm-hmm. Which was obviously just to make the creditors feel better because they really, I don't know if I stress enough, they really did not like dealing with him. Now, <laughs> do you think that that, I, how do you feel about that move, the resignation of Varoufakis? Oh, I think it's absolutely the wrong thing to make him resign. I mean, Varoufakis is just like, uh, we'll have to put up a link to his post about it on his blog. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's very, well, you know, I serve at the mercy of the people and if... Uh, 
the government is asking me to step down, I'm stepping down. I'm Yeah, he he was super gracious about it. Yeah. Which it, is another reason why it's so sad to see him no longer be a, a cabinet minister. Well, I think he expressed trust in Alex to make the right decision and he understands that the I I mean, I think that there is a strategic move here. You know, if you it it may very well be the fault of the creditors that the relationship was doomed from the start with with Varoufakis. But given that the relationship has already been poisoned, sometimes it is the right move to send in another guy. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, it, it's the same thing with, with, that you do when you play good cop, bad cop, or when you have Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. So I am not necessarily convinced that it was a bad move strategically. Now, granted, I re- I really like Varoufakis and I support him, but you got to play with the hand that you're dealt. I I think the, the Syriza needs to do what they think will be the best for Greece. And actually, speaking of that, that we we should bring up a whole other part of this that we haven't talked about yet, <laughs> which is the what's called the Grexit. Yeah, Greek exit, Grexit. Which mean okay, so there's the Eurozone where all of these European countries have, have come together in the European Union. And uh Greece could solve some of its problems by leaving the Eurozone, by by uh no longer being part of the European Union. And one of the benefits they get from leaving the European Union is they could n- then control their own currency because you know, that's one of the ways that you can you when you control your own currency you can devalue that currency which will make your products cheaper so it's easier to export it will make vacations to your land cheaper for travelers from other nations so it, it can boost your tourist industry and it can also kind of water down your debt oh you can just write a check to pay off your debt yeah which also spikes your uh, inflation, so yeah. it's not necessarily the best thing to do. But in the eyes of creditors, it's good because you're always good for your money then. Yeah. You can't be bad for it. But you might, yeah, so you might not just print like a thirty, a $300 billion uh, drachma coin and hand it over to the central bank. But you might... Is have that a dig little at bit the Weimar hot. Republic. What's that? Is that a dig at the Weimar Republic? <laughs> uh, no, no. It but should have been. There was that. Do you remember there was that whole thing about like the trillion dollar coin in uh, trillion dollar coin in the U.S. Right to I, solve this exact same problem. Yep. For them not wanting to pay it. But, but, yeah, they can technically make money and deposit it in their own account, and then the government would have the money. Yep. But I it would thi- be a bad idea. But yeah, I mean, I think the the fact of the matter is that yeah, you probably don't want to go to that extreme, but you can ease it by having a little bit higher inflation than you would otherwise normally have. You know, which which isn't, you know, it's going to make imports more expensive, which might be good for your economy because it means that it's going to be a a more economical choice for your people to buy locally, which will help your local economy. Yeah. I so also don't imagine many Greeks buying German goods these days. <laughs> Who knows? You know, maybe their favorite stuff is German. But the... I think... there. So there are benefits that Greek Greece can get from leaving the euro. However, there are lots of benefits to being in the eurozone as well and part of the european union i mean the 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 us is has a lot of these benefits because we function as one large country whereas you know that's kind of why the european union came about in the first place is things were just uh the you know the, the functioning as one united unit one united country has worked so well for the U.S. and, you know, Europe looked at that and said, you know, we kind of want to have that same, those same benefits. You know, all one currency, the, you know, a group that all works together. And so they tried that and it's, you know, not as strong of a union. The European Union is not as strong as the United States. 
uh, or at least it's not as together, I should say. The, the bonds between the states, you know, the difference between one state and another state are nowhere near as big here as the difference between Greece and France and Germany in the European Union. And so the idea of, of one of the European nations leaving the United or the European Union is totally possible. And it's something that both Greece and the creditors believe is a possibility. Yeah. Also, another thing with them leaving the euro, um, they would have to make their own currency, which isn't, you know, doesn't sound too bad, except to actually implement a new currency takes time. Mm hmm. And also is devalued. So in that time, there the worry about that, the reason why people are like, oh yeah, obviously we should just do that, is that you have a huge liquidity run. Everybody takes what they can and gets out while, you know, it's under the euro instead of the drachma. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and that's, and especially people with pensions are very worried about how that would affect their pensions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why it's such a, that's why they didn't immediately go, yeah, yeah, let's just leave. Now, when it came to the polls that were being run leading up to that yes-no vote that we mentioned, another th question that was asked in those polls is, do you believe Greece should stay in the Eurozone? And most Greeks believe that, yes, Greece should stay in the Eurozone. And that's basically what Alex has said, too, that, you know, the, the leader of uh, Syriza wanted to not have super harsh austerity, you know, to have a certain degree of autonomous control of their own economy, but to remain in the Eurozone. The creditors all say that they want Greece to stay in the Eurozone. However, they don't want to let Greece control their own economy. They want Greece to implement harsh austerity. Yeah. We should maybe mention the next part that's a little confusing in the timeline, and that is, so the Greeks did default on a loan while they were waiting for this vote, and they brought, and Germany refused to negotiate. Uh, and now that the no vote came through, they were given until today to present serious proposals for what to do. <laughs> and very confusingly, these serious proposals are almost identical to the austerity thing that they voted down, with the exception of the loan amount was higher um, for Greece, so that they wouldn't have to go through this rigmarole immediately again. I think there were some other changes, but you're there right were... that they were small. It was like, we don't want to cut pensions so much, and we want to be able to tax the rich a little bit more. Right, which a lot of people in Greece are understandably very unhappy about because mm -hmm. they just voted against this and now the government is offering to impose it upon itself and also things have come out to like um, basically Germany wants Greece to leave they in fact have now uh, last I looked at the news uh, just before this uh, Germany, or Germany, uh, well, I guess probably mostly Germany, Greece has been told that basically they won the austerity that they're then offering up has been told it's not enough. They need to cut even more. Mm -hmm. And that basically they need to accept this austerity or face a temporary exit. Ah, uh, yeah. Is what they're now trying to do. So it's austerity or leave, and they call it temporary, but I cannot imagine that that's actually going to be temporary in any way, shape, or form. It came out in an interview with I think it's, I don't remember the guy, oh, the Junker, the guy who's been working on his proposal. An interview was published today that he had done a bit ago, pushing for a five-year temporary Greek exit, and this is something that Varoufakis has talked about um, as well, is that the Germans are just trying to push Greece out. And yeah, it does indeed seem that part of the reason yeah, they're so ridiculous with their stuff is they don't want Greece to stay around. Let me ask you, let's back up a little bit, because I want to ask you a question, because I'm curious about your opinion on this. Why do you think that Alex's proposal was so meek, that it was so close to what the creditors wanted anyway? I think 
that he was expecting this no vote to really show the creditors, like, seriously, we are very serious about this. We have the people behind us. And right after the vote, too, he had a meeting with all of the parties in Greece about what to do next. Mm -hmm. So I think between the creditors' response of, yeah, we're not impressed. Also, you're in a worse spot now than you were before this. So that's going to factor into how much we think you need to cut out. I think that he... Yeah, in other words, the creditors wanted deeper cuts now. Yeah. Because you've waited longer sort of thing. Yeah, and now the economic situation, which is further exasperated by the Eurozone's direct maneuverings against them by refusing loans, letting them default, refusing to negotiate, and closing off the funding from the ECB. Well, And we, you know what? We should say also that there are countries that are on Greek side, or at least are really working to make a compromise that will keep Greece in the Eurozone, like France. Yeah. Uh, with their president, Hollande. Yeah. But, yeah, like you said, Germany is the one that really wants right. and to stick it to Greece, or kick them out. Yeah, and Germany's been basically the main blo- stick in the mud about this. They've been really the main opposition to this. That's, that's the whole problem is Germany's been doing this. The guy who was in charge of the austerity program for Ireland even said a month or two ago that he couldn't understand why they were trying to force such harsh things upon Greece that it made absolutely no sense. And Ireland, if you are not aware, did not receive a good program or plan. Mm -hmm. Theirs was also terrible. So that's somebody who put something like that on Ireland thinking that, you know, the proposals before these latest ones were terrible. Yep. So it's, yeah, I think Germany just wants them gone. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch at this point to say that Angela Merkel is one of the three worst German leaders in history, especially Uh for the welfare of Europe and the welfare of the people of Europe. And I don't think it's hyperbole to say that. Because, I mean... Depending on how this shakes out, like this could send the whole world back into a depression because they're being stubborn about nothing. You know. Do you think that this that if Greece leaves the Eurozone, that this will spell the end of the Eurozone? Like will it lead to further exits and and other massive problems? Depends if they fix the problems that exist within the Eurozone after they kick them out. I'm guessing they won't. I think, yeah, it will eventually lead to a spiraling down. Because with the Greek exit, it basically means the creditors get no money. Uh, and Oh, do you think so? Well, I wouldn't pay them back if I was Greece. If you were forced to leave the Eurozone? Forced to leave, have your economy go even more down the tube. And, oh, and you want us to pay you back still? Yeah, Man, I would I'm... just do a straight default or just print up money and be like, there you go, because give them essentially worthless money, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean either way, think... the creditors aren't going to get the money they need or want. I mean, they don't actually need it, but... So, I don't think that, I don't think that Greece will probably, will just, like not pay any of the debt. Maybe they'll print up money well, to pay it. they can't even afford to but, pay the debt. Yes, but I think that there is a, a decent amount of the debt that they still intend to pay back. And even if they left the Eurozone, I think they probably would try to do what they could for that. And this is why. I think they're too small of a country to say, we don't need any international help. Yeah, but they could get international help from people that aren't in the Eurozone. Yeah. Like, scarily, uh, Vladimir Putin has expressed his support for Greece and the Greek people. I think just anything that makes Europe mad, Vladimir Putin wants to support. (laughs) Yeah, but, I mean, Russia is still a large economy. Yes, that's true. You know, so, I don't know. I don't know. 
I I think that yeah, they should basically just refuse to pay if they're forced out because it, no matter what's going to happen, the country this might end up hurting the most is Germany. It, if they decide not to pay that debt, that could hurt pretty bad. Yeah. Or I mean, they might pay Germany last or something, you know. Yeah. And and it also should be mentioned too. After World War II, Germany had massive amount of debt and. Greece, along with its other creditors, wrote off most of its debt and restructured the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I think they wrote off half, right? And then the rest of it was expanded to 30 years to pay off. I I forget what it originally was, but they expanded the time frame and wrote off half of it. Right. And Greece wasn't even asking to to the for a haircut is I guess the term, yeah. which is such a boring term. It's for for writing down debt. It's an economics term. Yeah. Um and that yeah, not only that, that's after, you know, like the Greeks, what did they do? Well, they kinda got screwed over by the European partners. Whereas Germany had the Nazis <laughs> destroy <laughs> Europe and murder a massive amount of people. Mm-hmm. And after that they got not unfavorable things. So it's it's extra hyper ridiculous of mm. Germany. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so it's an interesting situation. And it will be completely different by the time anyone hears this. Because, yeah, like decision time is supposed to be today. I mean, let's check. What, what do you think the chances are that an actual decision will happen today? I'm clicking through, or looking through quick stuff. Saying... Basically, that I think it looks like maybe by Wednesday they need to have an answer. See, they pushed it back again. Well, I don't don't know. I'm just looking at the headlines quick without reading through. By the time that this comes out, which will be in a week, we're recording this a week from the release date, I think that there will be new components to the conversation. But I think we still won't know if there is a deal or if there's going to be a Greek (laughs) exit. Here we go. Here's a list. That's my prediction. Is we still won't know. Okay. Here's a list of reforms. I'm reading a tweet. Uh, here's a list of reforms in the Eurogroup draft that the Greek government has to pass by Wednesday to get bailout. So, and it's so ostensibly now we should know by Wednesday. We were supposed to know by today, and now we're going to know by Wednesday. Well, I think today was when the proposals had to be pr- given. Yep. So, yeah. So, do you think that we will have an answer on Wednesday? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get an answer ever. Probably How- Thursday, I'll say we'll have an answer. What do you think is the best possible outcome? Uh, the best possible outcome is that they do what the Greeks wanted originally, and that is give them a loan, restructure it, and allow them to like redo their economy, not with austerity, but within ways that they actually can improve the economy and improve the lives of people in Greece without all of this nonsense, which will actually be more beneficial to the creditors because they will get paid quicker. Mm-hmm. That that's that's what should happen because that's the only thing that actually makes any sense. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. So I mean, I think although the, the, the if creditors... there's a Greek exit, it could start to happen. I mean, that honestly for Greece, the Greek people might be the best realistic option for them. So I think one of the most interesting parts of this is the fact that Alex's proposal was so meek. Um. Do you know Paul Mason? No. He is a reporter for the BBC. And he does he loves a lot of left-wing politics stuff. And he's been reporting on Greece and he made a comment that I thought was very interesting. His speculation cuz he you know, he doesn't know why Alex proposed this either. You know, it wasn't he didn't ask him, didn't get an answer straight from him. He said that part of it could be that He's basically testing the waters to see if Greece has any place whatsoever in the Eurozone. In other words, if if the creditors reject Alex's extremely meek proposal, it means that they are not willing to negotiate with Greece at all, and essentially that Greece has no place in the Eurozone, which is an important 
It's basically what their reaction was. It's an important stand to take because when when your stance of your country is we want to stay in the eurozone, but we also want a write off. Basically, I think what the creditors have said is we're going to gamble that your desire to stay in the eurozone is greater than your desire to avoid austerity. And by the creditors rejecting even the smallest concessions to Greece, I think what they're going to do is actually empower Greece to make the threat of an exit a real possibility. And maybe Greece, do you think that Germany really wants that? Yeah, I think the leaders of Germany want that. Maybe. I think... I think that that's a big mistake on their part. Just, I mean, from a financial perspective, like, uh, if, I think it stopped being. I don't know when or why it stopped being financial, but I think it stopped being financial for Germany. I think it became like a pride thing almost. That that could be because, like, let let's do like a micro example of this. Let's say that I have my own little small bank and I give out loans, and um, there there's a gentleman. Who? Oh, let's make it you. You can be the banker. You'll you'll be the banker, so I'll be the the person in trouble. Let's right. say that you you give out loans and uh, you gave out uh, you gave a loan to me um, to I don't know start a business or something like that. And um, it, it turns out my business is not doing so well. So you're a little bit afraid that I might not be able to pay you back the let's say twenty thousand dollars that I borrowed. And so what you do is you say, okay, you're going to have to uh, pay back um, more every month now because I'm a little bit afraid that I might not be getting. And I tell you, Ooh. if I pay more back more every month, that's going to cripple my business. I'm going to have to go out of business because I won't be able to afford to keep running if I have to pay you And then I tell that you, much. you shouldn't have gotten an adjustable rate loan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, yeah, that's exactly kind of what's going on. And then, and then I say, well, you can up my interest rates and kick me out of business or whatever. And the the interesting thing here is with Greece leaving, you know, in a micro example, if you're a big enough bank, you're going to have a way to get your money one way or another. Oh, if I'm a but, big enough bank, I keep your business and sell it. Yeah, and keep all the money you've but, paid me. But, yeah, you can go ahead and keep my business. Let's say it's limited liability, so you can't g grab any of my personal assets. Uh, you can go ahead and keep my business, but guess what I'm going to do the week before you take my business? I'm going to make everything worthless. The, the <laughs> I'll ruin all of the business connections. Nothing will... You know, I'll, I don't know. I, the, I probably won't be taking care of that business and making it worth anything leading up to the point where you take control of it. And I'll say, see ya. Take the worst worthless business. I'm going on to the next thing. Right, like and when people get uh, their houses foreclosed and have been destroying them. Yeah, 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 that's what we saw here. So, I, I mean, I think it's a mistake on the Greeks' part because what, or uh, excuse me, it's a mistake on the Germans' part to basically push Greece out of business because it's better to have that business functioning and still collecting on that loan even if it's not as a, at a higher rate as you wanted yeah instead you can ruin the whole loan and it'll go south and uh, not you, to mention you won't be able to I know Merkel had made some speech declaring whatever happens it's Greece's fault but I'm pretty sure she's basically the only one in the world who holds that position. I think a lot of people uh, in stuff I've seen on both the right and the left pretty squarely put this on her feet. I don't know. It will be very interesting. It. I think the media... I in, don't think she will get reelected. I, I think the media in Europe has done a very good job of making Greece look bad. Oh, You know, yeah. to make them make it sound like they're lazy people, like it's a problem with, like, yeah. just the personality of yeah. the Greek, or I, the character of super the racist. Greek person. Yeah, And exactly. I do, I have, keep having this argument with people when I bring up Greece, is that, no, they're not lazy. It doesn't matter what their retirement age is. It really doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. 
Well, and their retirement age is actually not that much different than other retirement ages in Europe. Yeah. And the amount that you get for your retirement pension is lower. So when you compare those two things together, they're about on par with what every pension system is in in Europe. They they get to they're a little bit on the earlier side, but it's a little bit lower pay. So it kind of balances out. Unless they accept these terms, in which case they will have even less pension. And 67 will be the retirement age. Wow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's... Yeah. I I think that... That... Uh, the Germans might be calling a bluff to their fault. Yeah. And uh, what... what By doing that, by getting such an awful deal from the creditors... I think what they're going to be doing is going to be changing the minds of the Greek people. The Greek people wanted to stay in, in the Eurozone, but if they're forced to take on such awful austerity that they do not support, I think the Eurozone is going to make the idea of leaving, or you know, Germany specifically, is going to be making the idea of, sound, of leaving the Eurozone sound better and better. You know, I, I think... Syriza would have been rejected by its own people if they had tried uh, an exit to the Eurozone as a main strategy. Yeah. But by doing this, they can clearly show their people that they had no other choice. So here's a question then. If they don't leave the Eurozone and they finally accept these harsh terms, what do you think? I think that that will empower the Greek Communist Party to... I'll be curious if it will empower the Greek Communist Party then for the next elections, or if terrifyingly, it will empower the Golden Dawn. Yeah, which is the extreme right-wing... They're Nazis. Yes. Look at their flag. It It's a... Yeah, it's it a is, clear reference It is a to swastika by... Uh, yeah, it it's... Yeah, look it up. It looks just like a... It looks like somebody's like, how do I draw a swastika without people immediately going, that's a swastika. I think people still immediately go, that's a swastika. <laughs> well, without it technically being one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, although thankfully, at least when Saritza was elected, they actually lost popularity because they were up to almost 10%, and I think they only got 3%, which is still a terrifying amount. Th there's a quote, Any percent is a scary percent. <laughs> there's a quote from some... Marxist who said that every every fascism is a failed revolution. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I don't you know who that said quote? that, but I've heard that. Uh, okay, show notes thing. We'll <laughs> we'll look it up. Also, you know who's all very excited about all this stuff? Speaking of fascists, Marie Le Pen is just frothing at the mouth for this turbulence in Europe. Who's that again? She is the leader of the National Front, the oh. French Nazis. Okay. So she's loving this. And after the Charlie Hebdo shootings, they also saw a huge spike in poll numbers. It was to the point where if there was an election like within, uh, I don't know what if they've polled again since then, but the last polls I saw for France, she would have won if there was an election. Wow. Yeah. So she's loving this, and that might be a terrifying development. Very interesting. So in other words, basically, if they get elected, we can blame Germany again for the rise of fascists. I'm going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that might be no, laying no, it no, on a little no, too no, thick. No. I've never heard of hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that might be a little hyperbolic. You know, I can't actually imagine any of these fascist parties getting in power, but if they did, I would totally blame Germany. I, I should probably stop railing you in when you go too hyperbolic, because I think hyperbole makes good uh, podcasts, makes it more interesting, right? That's yeah. what we're... I think what we should have... You know, An episode of just me being hyperbolic. <laughs> yeah, extremely hyperbolic, and then we should get like just the most extreme right wing nut job on here, and we just Oof. all yell at each other for sixty minutes. Yeah, no, forget that final stop with the hyperbole. All right, don't threaten me with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be awful. <laughs> no, I prefer reasonable people. Actually, yeah, I think a lot of from what we hear from our fans, a lot of people enjoy our 
reasoned discussions. Yeah, I try and keep that hyperbole under yeah. control. I suppose if people really want to see people yelling at each other with, you know, completely with no constructive debate whatsoever, there's they can lots turn of on TV any channels, news, yeah. yeah, that can do that. Okay, well, all right, we've gone on a long time about this. Yeah, that's that's about enough grease for one day. Yeah, you know what that made me think of? What grease lightning? <laughs> Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison Chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.